together for a somber ceremony as the nation prepares to pay its final respects this week to former First Lady Rosalind Carter, the beloved wife of former President Jimmy Carter. Her life as his, dedicated to public service and humanitarian work. You can see the motorcade there uh, on your screen. She died at their home in Plains, Georgia on Sunday, November 19th, just a little more than a week ago now. She was 96 years old. Mrs. Carter, suffering from dementia, had just entered hospice care. Jimmy and Rosalind Carter, inseparable throughout most of their lives. Childhood sweethearts married for 77 years. In fact, the longest married couple in presidential history. The former president, Jimmy Carter, is now 99 years old, describing his wife as an equal partner in everything he ever accomplished. In just a few moments, we'll continue to see the motorcade carrying Mrs. Carter. It will leave Phoebe Sumter Medical Center in America's Georgia. And there is a brief departure ceremony at the hospital, which we'll see here live. Family members, uh, medical staff have all gathered. Former members of her Secret Service detail will serve as honorary pallbearers. The procession will then go into Georgia Southwestern State University, where there will be a wreath-laying ceremony at the Rosalind Carter Health and Human Sciences Complex. From there, the procession will take her to the Carter Presidential Center in Atlanta, where a private arrival ceremony will take place, followed by a short service for Library Museum and Carter Center staff. Mrs. Carter will lie in repose in the Library Museum lobby for public viewing beginning later today. I want to bring in ABC's Steve Osinsami in America's Georgia. And Steve has covered the Carters for many years for us. Uh, extraordinarily moving, Steve. And this was a partnership right until the end. It was. Um, their, their partnership was part of their success. You know, there's this saying that success is a, is a, is a team sport. Um, the former president was very open about the fact that, that his wife was a key part of his success. She, he often called her his secret weapon. Uh, she was active in his administration. She was active in his life post-presidency. They founded the Carter Center together. She was very much a part of that. Um, you know, I'll tell you, David, it's a, it's a cold, crisp day here in Americas. The sun is shining nicely on this event. Uh, the skies are fairly clear. There are around me what looks to be maybe a hundred or so people who are standing outside along the road to get a glimpse of this, to say their final goodbye. We expect to see lines of people today at the Carter Center uh, to give their best wishes to this former first lady of the United States and, of course, of Georgia. David. Steve, we know they were childhood sweethearts. Uh, they met there in Plains, Georgia. Of course, Jimmy Carter was in the Navy. Uh, they married uh, not long after his return, uh, traveled the country, uh, began raising their children, uh, and then he entered politics. In the beginning, a bit of a surprise to Rosalind, but she made it very clear to him along the way that we would be partners in this if you're going to continue uh, to work at this. Uh, and she was on the campaign to become president, his election uh, to the White House. And in fact, in many ways, uh, she changed the role of first lady, had an office in the East Wing, had a full policy staff of her own. That was a first. Uh, she held weekly lunches with her husband uh, in the private dining room where he would ask her, what is your week? What's on your agenda? Uh, and she would often ask him after the end of a busy day at the White House, why did you do that? What was the reason behind that? And eventually, Martha Raddatz, he simply said, well, why don't you come to some of these cabinet meetings? And so she did. Uh, she certainly did, David. She she had a very powerful role. Uh, President Carter said she is an almost equal extension of myself. She wanted to make a difference there in the White House. She wanted to make a difference in the country. Mental health was a very big issue for Rosalind Carter. She also supported the Equal Rights Amendment. She was a strong advocate of that. And when I think about her life, and I think uh, 70 years ago when she moved back to Plains, Georgia, she didn't really want to do that. Jimmy Carter had been in the Navy. She was enjoying a life of some adventure and some independence. And they'll talk about that as one of the most difficult periods of their marriage. Uh, another unusual thing about the Carters because they were very honest about their marriage. They didn't have this glowing picture that it was perfect all the time saying no marriage is perfect, but theirs was perfect in so many ways. When she moved back to Plains, Georgia, she said, 
I don't want to go. And, and yet she did it. Think about that. 70 years ago, in the 50s, the role of women in the 50s was uh, to be only a, only a wife, only a mother, and only there to support your husband. She did all that as well. Uh, there is a great story about her getting up early every single morning for 25 years to make Jimmy Carter a big breakfast of grits and toast and coffee and juice. And then when they moved into the White House, he said, you know what, I, I just want orange juice. And she said, I wish I'd known that 25 <laughs> years ago. So she was just a, an extraordinary woman and really, really helped change the role of the first lady of the, uh, of the United States. She was really a fine example, David. As you know, Martha, we're looking at live pictures now of the pallbearers. And as I mentioned a moment ago, many of them are former members of her Secret Service detail. We saw live pictures there moments ago of the family. Of course, the Carters have three sons, Jack, Chip, and Jeff and a daughter, Amy. Uh, we watched her grow up uh, in the White House, uh, the tree house, the fort built on the White House grounds, 11 grandchildren, uh, 14 great-grandchildren. The family gathered there today, and you can see uh, Mrs. Carter's remains now being brought out as part of this uh, ceremony uh, outside the medical center. Uh, in these final days uh, together, and they were the longest living uh, first couple that this nation, surpassing uh, former President George H.W. Bush and Barbara Bush um, in the end. And they spent their final days together. And I want to bring in Mary Jordan, ABC contributor, Washington Post reporter. Mary, you uh, spoke with the family about those final moments. And it was so moving for me to read in your reporting that their two beds, both of them in hospice, had been placed sort of um, feet to feet, if you will, so they could prop the beds up and actually look at one another, even in those final days. And that was Jimmy Carter's idea. Instead of putting them side by side, he said, no, no, I want to I wanna look at her. And so they, they both were propped up and that they could keep talking um, and right up until the end. And then he, when she did pass, um, Jimmy Carter said to his kids that were in the room, I just need some time alone with her. Um, you know, it's a long time that they were together. I'm, I'm so struck by these photos of the Secret Service. I've spent a lot of time in planes, and unlike other, uh, you know, jobs that they have with some of the other presidents, they rotate in and out. But when you went down to planes, what these guys here, who are the honorary pallbearers, did in the last 20 years was they'd go fishing on the pond outside, or they would, even until a few years ago, help lift President Carter into a pool because he was very avid swimmer and wanted to keep up and swimming. It was a different pace, it was a slower pace, and they really got to know the Carters. And I'm not at all surprised that they all showed up here. A moving tribute. And Mary, how, what do we know about the former president, Jimmy Carter? You, you have reported in recent days that uh, he is aware, uh, remarkably sharp at times. I know he's lost a lot of weight. Uh, they're making a suit for him, and he's hopeful he can be part of the tributes uh, and services this week. The, uh, you know, it's by the hour, but the most recent reports was that he was determined to go to Atlanta. Um, I'm not sure if it's today or t for tomorrow's tribute. Um, and then to come back home for the family funeral in Plains on Wednesday. Uh, I think a lot of people said they're so close. You know, there's many stories about when one spouse goes, the other one goes quickly. But, you know, he was eating caramel cake that his uh, niece made. Uh, he was getting his suit ready for the funeral. And he just said to some, I don't want to disappoint her. I want to show up there. Um, it is something to watch them. I've, I've seen them interact so many times, including recently. And it's, it's, you can't overestimate how much time they spent together. They were in this little house that they helped build in Plains, 1961, the same house. Um, I once calculated that the Secret Service vehicle outside the house was worth more than the little house that they lived in. But, you know, this small place, they spent an enormous amount of time together. So it's going to be a shock to the system for Jimmy Carter, who, of course, is 99, and himself in hospice. <laughs>
That's the extraordinary thing. They define their roles long after the presidency uh, in so many different ways. Their humanitarian work together, uh, their trips around the world, uh, their push for medical care for communities uh, in places where uh, impoverished communities have very little access uh, to health care. You'd often see them out building for Habitat for Humanity side by side. Uh, and as Mary describes there, side by side in the end, y you reported that one of their sons, Chip, uh, had shared with you uh, that moment when his father said, uh, could you give me some time alone um, with your mother? Uh, that was the day before uh, she passed. And then on Sunday, when the sun rose, uh, she was no longer able to speak. And again, he asked for uh, some private moments um, with his wife of 77 years, uh, tears streaming down his face. Uh, and Chip told you, uh, Mary, I believe, that they taught us uh, so many things. You know, Chip is 73 years old, his father 99, his mother was 96, and he said, among the things our parents taught us was grace. It's, uh, he called her Rosie. Um, we had dinner not too long ago, and he'd say, come on, kid, come on, Rosie. Um, they were very, very sweet couple. And when you saw them as they grew old, um, it was kind of hard to believe that they ever lived in the White House. They were not in any way uh, what people would say glamorous or fancy, but they were very smart, very dedicated, and they wanted to make their life count. And they said that many times. That's why they worked against disease in Africa, building homes in America, of course, Rosalind was really big on vaccinations for children and mental health. Uh, and Jimmy, very, very open about, I couldn't have done any of this without Rosalind. Said she was an equal partner in all that I achieved as we watched this motorcade begin. Mary, our thanks to you. Uh, Steve, you know, I, I listened to Mary as she described uh, the very humble home that they returned to Plains, Georgia uh, to live in. I know you uh, had the opportunity in the last couple of years to visit that home. So many people had asked them along the way, what was their secret? Rosalind Carter once said, uh, space. We gave each other the space, and he certainly gave her the space, is what she said, to explore her own interests and to play a role uh, in a way that we had not seen in the White House. And they, they shared more with you, though, about uh, the secrets to such a strong partnership, a love affair that lasted until the very end. They did, and they loved talking to us about it. Um, I, when, when we spoke to them last, it was their final interview together with us. Um, it was both Rosalind and the former president. One of the things I remembered was seeing the president light up as he is watching his wife speak and take questions about their love and their relationship and their history. And, you know, you mentioned a, a, about their home and the Secret Service. And when you, when you drive past the home, one of the things you notice is that the building that has the Secret Service vehicles looks from the road <laughs> almost as big as the house um, because their house is so small. And that is some of what people have come to love about this couple and about Rosalind was the old fashioned charm that their relationship just showed, the, the, the togetherness that they have. They, they talk to me about uh, every night trying to make sure that they do something together. They talked about fly fishing in that pond near that home and I was surprised that they still did that at the time. They also talked about reading the Bible together every night and told me that one of their secrets is that they would not go to bed angry, that they would discuss whatever disagreements they had during the day. It was absolutely a beautiful thing to witness, and it's something that I think resonates with so many people who look in on their relationship and just see the joy and the love that they had for each other and how they nourished each other with that love. You know, with with Rosalind and, 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 and the former president, another thing is, you know, they weren't fancy people. I think that's fair to say. Even at the Carter Center, where her body will be headed to this afternoon, they had a, a small apartment. Um, and, and they didn't have big things. There was a Murphy bed in the apartment. That's where they slept. 
when they stayed at the Carter Center in this small little apartment with the Murphy bed that they that they put down. And, and, and they enjoyed the time that they spent together in that small space and in these small spaces. It, it was such a treat to talk with them and to look in on the joy that they had in their relationship, David. They were an example uh, in so many ways, as you point out, Steve. Uh, they often talked about not going to bed, uh, having fought without resolving whatever the disagreement might have been. And they described those disagreements as often minor and who couldn't relate to that. And on the few times when they weren't together, they would choose the passage of the Bible that they would be reading, knowing that they would both be reading separately uh, the same part from the Bible, that that was very rare that they were ever apart. Uh, it trips later on in life, perhaps now and then. I want to bring in our chief White House correspondent, Mary Bruce. Uh, Mary, what do we expect uh, as far as uh, the first family, President Biden, the first lady, Jill Biden, their involvement in these ceremonies this week? Well, David, we know that the Bidens will be down in Georgia tomorrow for that uh, memorial service there, reflecting and remembering Rosalind Carter's amazing contributions to the country, but also really just saying goodbye to a dear, dear friend. The relationship between these two families is a true and genuine relationship. This isn't some, you know, D.C. friendship of political convenience. They are dear, genuine friends, and they have supported each other for decades, really, going back uh, to 1976, when Joe Biden, then a young senator, was the first official outside of Georgia to endorse Jimmy Carter's run for president. Uh, the two have stayed close uh, ever since, the two families. In fact, the Bidens last visiting the Carters back in April of 2021 at their home in Georgia, spending you know, a lot of time together. President Biden saying it was nice simply to catch up, to talk about the old days. Uh, Jill Biden then saying this wasn't about you know a meeting of two presidents, but actually four friends coming together, spending time together, uh, uh, two couples who have really supported each other for many, many years. And the president reflecting on that relationship in a statement uh, shortly after Rosalind's passing, talking about her hope, her warmth, her optimism, saying that she walked her own path, but David, that she inspired a nation along the way. And she certainly inspired uh, this president and the Biden family as well. No question about that, Mary. And in helping to define the role of the first lady, having her office in the East Wing, her policy staff, you know, people knew at the time, uh, senior advisors within the Carter administration, that Rosalind Carter was the way to her husband in so many ways and some of the more uh, difficult issues. She had a nickname in the White House at the time, Steel Magnolia. She was revered, respected, but also feared in some ways. And uh, in all of my reading, uh, I, I read that she didn't mind that nickname, Steel Magnolia, and we know uh, from so many administrations after the Carters that often the First Lady's role, uh, they're all defined a little differently, but that is one key component that uh, senior advisors find uh, the President of the United States often uh, through their spouse. I think that nickname was, was one that she wore as a badge of honor. I think you are right about that, David. And she redefined the role and really paved the way for all of the first ladies who have you know, taken and assumed this office since then. You know, Not just in the way that she supported her husband, but in the issues that, that she uh, decided to tackle as well. And yes, you are right, certainly every first lady uh, defines the role in her own way. Uh, but it is because of Rosalind Carter, I think, that you have really seen such a transformation in the way that the East Wing has a lot of power in this building as well, David. Mary Bruce, my thanks to you. Uh, Mary Jordan as well. Martha Raditz, Steve Osinsami, the motorcade having left the medical center there in America. So we'll head now to the Carter Presidential Center. It'll arrive early this afternoon uh, there in Atlanta, part of uh, three days here where the nation will remember a first lady who helped define the role of a first lady in the White House. She was asked uh, later in life how she wanted to be remembered. Uh, and she hoped that her humanitarian work, her work on mental health during her time in the White House would be remembered. And certainly that's just part of a, a, a fuller portrait of a first lady that we will honor over the course of the next three days. Our coverage will continue throughout the day on ABC News Live, abcnews.com. You can also see Mrs. Carter's memorial service tomorrow and her funeral on Wednesday on ABC News Live. I'll be back with the entire team a little later today for World News Tonight. I'm David Muir in New York. Until then, have a good day.